Good morning, everybody. It's 9.30 and in maintenance time, we're already five minutes late. So we're gonna start. Uh, my name is Ron McCorkle. I'm the Director of Maintenance of the Milwaukee County Transit. I've been with the Transit for 29 years. I've done pretty much a lot of the jobs in the system. Um, but that being said, I'm no expert in BEBs. That's why Tony's here, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. So that has improved my score. So uh, we were approached over three years ago about, you know, uh, we had the talk and uh, anybody who's had the talk knows that necessary isn't always a good thing when someone says, come on in, I wanna to talk to you for a minute. So we had to talk about preparing for battery electric buses. Um, in doing so, I will first say, I am honored to be here. I was honored to ask to speak to uh, peers and colleagues. Uh, a lot of you hopefully are in a room are properties I've called and asked for suggestions and I've asked for help. So that's very important. So in the talk, we're gonna have six steps. And if anybody realizes there's steps in life, this does relate to other topics. Some of you probably know these six steps better than I do. But step one is why me denial? I mean, and you're in maintenance. Uh, we have everything we're doing right now between COVID and uh, clean air diesels and hybrids and electric and electric's coming on, but you realize uh, electric is finally, in my terms, is coming to sustainable where it's actually more reliable platform right now. So step one, why me? Well, obviously it's time to move on. The property has been recognized and you're going to take that next leap into uh, where you need to go with the future in your transit. And then the reality sinks in, you know, do I have a problem where I start? And the big underlying question is here's where do I start? You're gonna ask for help. You know, how are these BEBs gonna be used? I mean, if you talk to different bus manufacturers, there's variations of them. Are you gonna use these on trippers or all day runs? Are you using them on a BRT? What is your charging platform? Are you gonna go depot, you're gonna go in route? So there's not one vanilla cone here for one property to say, this is my plan, this is gonna work for you. So we really gotta know what is your application gonna be for your buses? Step four, this one will definitely um, brings, it, brings its challenges. So you're gonna need to either write or approve an RFP for a BEB for buses, for charging infrastructure that you probably know very little about. And this is why Tony's here. And I know Mike Zabel's here from HNTB, one of our engineering firms. You're going to have to get help on this. Uh, we elected to take a, one of our diesel specs and we conformed it to BBs because we wanted same components and stuff like that. But I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's a task. So you're gonna need the help. And then you need to start thinking of what's the really underlying costs of the project and you bring it in these BEBs. It's not as simple as when you write a diesel spec and you get your, you know, your responses back and the bus is X and you pretty much bring it in and you go right in the operations. So um, our cost to set up the backside of this project right now is approximately 40% of the cost of the buses. Now, I don't know who really ever thought about that or think about that when these, you know, when you get that initial price tag that for X, I can have electric bus, but you know, there's a lot with the infrastructure, upgrades, uh, your property, bus lifts, doors, HVLC systems that uh, has to go into that. So, and step five, are you ready for BBs? Probably not. And this is where like one of the six steps, you're gonna need to find a support group. Um, and then find support group of your peers. And I, is, is anybody from Metro Transit here? Okay, Carrie Desmond and David Hass up there. Uh, they were like my surrogate parents. Um, I called them a lot. I called uh, Indigo and I would talk to uh, uh, Pace and a few others. And really that's where you're really gonna learn of already things that lessons learned from them. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just need to make it your will.
And the last step, reach for freedom and stay there. Um, you have to be really open-minded to this final state of life, so to speak. You're gonna look at the final accomplishments and then you're gonna realize that that accomplishment is always gonna be moving. That is really a moving target. I think with this, uh, with this industry, when your buses and the platforms and the simple fact you're gonna expect batteries to get better in two to three years and, and the industry itself. So this, you may get there, but I don't think you'll never get to the comfortable spot uh, as this develops. So before I go to the next slide, and I'm happy to see my managing director, Dan Baines here, because I remember the day clearly he came to me and said, Ron, can you design a BEB bus? And he knows how much I'd love this platform to begin with. I said, Dan, absolutely. I can do this for you. I'll be right back. Dan, I'll be back in five minutes. Milwaukee's first official BEB bus. It was three volts. It got about two blocks before we had to change out the batteries. Now, Dan was not in a jovial mood this morning, and I did not pick up on that. And that's, that's my problem. So this is what was presented, and Dan said no. And I said, well, why not? What's wrong with the concept? Dan said, well, I don't like the batteries they're showing. OK, so we came up with the second one. We kept the advertising for marketing everything on this bus. This is down in Milwaukee. Um, and this is where you know, it didn't get funny more, and I realized that we were going to have to get help and this was a serious project. So that's just a little humor. This, these two buses are actually like in someone's office and held for gold right now. It's kind of hilarious. Okay, so if we go back to step two now, where do I start in the reality sinks in? Uh, you know, do I have a problem? So the first thing you are gonna have to do is you're gonna have to get help. And again, our peers are in the building. Uh, there's enough properties who've been through what I will say is the first and second generation of either electric buses or hybrids that they're available to assist. And I've never found a property not to, willing to assist us. Everybody in the room here belongs to either WIPTA or MIPTA. And again, the electric buses and the platforms are up here. Uh, call around, speak with the bus builders, give them your business card. They will surely make sure they follow up with you and tell you everything that's great about the platform. And that's important, again, for you to understand that this is their bus. How would it apply to the platform? What's the end use of that bus? Ask for references. And that's really important, too, because that's where we started calling around and I started figuring out that um, a certain system or a certain battery or a certain BRT um, Design will work better for Milwaukee than some of the others that are out there. So that's really, really important. And then the last thing is just trust and verify. You have to make sure what you're requesting is what you want and get. And that's really on the property to do that. So that's, that's a really important step. Okay, step three for asking how, this is, this is actually very important and I would highly suggest this. And this uh, again came from Metro Transit you're gonna to have to hire additional staff. If you, unless you have a lot of staff laying around that has really expertise in engineering and electrical engineering and stuff, you're going to have to hire additional staff to handle the task of going through the project, the RP and everything. You're gonna to have to hire professional engineering firms. I mean, in Milwaukee, we've hired HNTB and Mike, where you at? Mike Zabel is here. Mike came all the way up here to support us. Phenomenal. We got AECOM in Milwaukee. MJ Bradley helped write the spec, and Illum, Illum uh, Architects is helping with the actual plans for all the uh, depot chargers at KK Garage. So, okay, step four, write or approve a BB charging RP. Now, I know there's a lot of state contracts you can go on. I'm not a big fan of that because I simply as a property, I wanna control the conversation. I want the bus to be what we want for our expectations. And the downside of that is it takes a lot of time and resources. So uh, we took a diesel spec and we cleaned it up. Uh, it worked. Uh, I know it's out there because I know it's being used or looked at by other properties, but um, if you can't get one, can you obtain one from another uh, transit property? And that question is yes. I know LA Metro offered me theirs. And then the last thing there is uh, the three hours of maintenance, which is review, review, 
and review. And it's probably like the 10 hours. You're gonna review these documents and the RPs and the proposals. And if you don't know what's being proposed, make sure you ask and then trust and verify. All right, step five, are you ready for BEBs? And then, you know, this goes back to a, my father used to tell me, you know, measure once, check twice. As the plan evolves, you're gonna have to really make sure everything you want, your ducks are in line, whether it's from the bus built to the infrastructure is exactly what you want. You're gonna have to really review things uh, and make sure that your wishes come through so the engineering teams understand how you want to apply these things. What new uh, systems or equipment are required for BEB? Um, about $6 million in Milwaukee, and that's no lie. So again, the bus is X, up, major upgrades to electrical infrastructure, uh, 13 new lifts, new doors, new HV, HVAC systems to pull it up. So the buses, the buses are taller, you know, 137 inches, I believe that's BYD. The buses are 18 tons. Most of the lifts on the market, like in my building where they're over 30 years old will not handle that bus anymore. So, um, and then they're going to new training requirements. I mean, we've got to train my mechanics from diesels to electric. We have to train our staff, our tankers, our dispatchers and first responders. They're gonna to respond to a bus that's in a collision or a, some are accident. They're gonna to have to know that this isn't a diesel bus anymore. And what do they have to do to safely possibly work on this bus? So. And then last but not least, and we just found this out, we've already purchased a lot of PPE that we need for the mechanics. That was, and it was great, which is a great investment. And now well, before we even put it into play, I have to have it sent out to be recertified because every six months that has to be recertified from a uh, private party. So this is all the things you don't know when you get into this that you didn't have with your diesels or uh, your CNGs. Okay, step six, reach freedom and stay there. You need to continue to review, measure, and test the BEB plan as it develops. Things will change. You may know the dimension of your bus and the end use of it. Do not assume that anybody else who's retained to work on the project does. Your, your transit, their engineers. You know, this guy does something in the street. He doesn't know the bus. He doesn't know the ADA features. He doesn't know ADA requirements. This is where communication is key to be successful. And finally, always have a contingency plan for success. Um, I'm blessed to have a lot of veterans on my staff and we always have a plan B and C and that's the way we generally roll. So um, we've had a few opportunities in our development and because of the, our great rapport with our teams and the engineers, they are generally very quickly resolved and it hasn't cost us anything in delays or anything of that nature. <coughs> So this is an example, and I'm gonna see if I can stop this video here real quick. This is not my laptop. So before MCTS did any work on the 32 BRT platforms, based upon what we knew on the buses we elected to receive, and based upon the plans for the BRT, we knew that we needed to train our operators to drive the buses differently. And we didn't want to wait to day one of the launch and we didn't want to wait to put them in a you know a bus that's a million dollars and have them uh, test their skill set so uh, again with the engineering firms we it was a great idea we decided we actually have a test platform for training our operators right on property and it's right outside my window so that's the good and bad of that so this has been a uh good morning this has been a godsend for us because now we're able to test things as things developed. And so this is one of the first things. We have a platform design. Uh, we decided to end up doing 12 inches. And as you see, as the bus comes through, the yellow line on the curved side is going to simulate a poly strip, which we don't have yet. So that's the rub rail to protect the bus from hitting the structure. The second other thing we're looking at, and this is based on impact from almost every property has the BRT is we're really, we don't want to teach the operators to hit that platform anymore. Um, the buses generally do not really well when you hit a 14 inch piece of concrete for the length of 40 feet. 
So the other line you'll see on there is the bus pulls in, and this is something we use at MCTS. This is not, you know, we developed something great here. The operators, when they come on the pits, they're trained to just line up their steering wheel with the line and not pay attention to the open hole in the ground because they feel, all feel they're going to fall in. So we're using the same concept here. And again, we're, we're testing as the project progresses. So you see as the bus pulls in, uh, this is a mechanic, this isn't even a driver. He pulls up, you can see how far we'd be off the rub rail. Bus comes in and this is another one, this is an angle so from inside the bus and we're lining up and those cones are actually there later too. We, we simulated those too when the bus pulling away from the structure. At 12 inches, the bus was vertically almost be able to swing right out without hitting the structure. Ramp comes out. And there you go. So as you see the people are in the background, that's our training department. And this is a little quick side story. So uh, a young lady from our marketing team was shooting all this video for me, Brianne, and she's all about this big. And we're very blessed. Uh, Brianne said to me, Ron, can I drive a bus? And I said, absolutely. So I said, you're gonna drive it right now. So we put down our camera. She got into the bus. She couldn't reach the pedals, which I thought was a little amusing. So after we showed her how to adjust the seat, got her in it. She drove the bus all the way around the property, came in. She's never driven a 40 foot bus. I said, just line up on that line. She lined up on the line and pulled in perfect. We were five inches off the platform. Our lesson learned there is, and, and Mike's been able to help us with this. So when we do the next testing on this platform, we're going to a four inch rub rail to bring the bus even closer. To close, up that, to close up that distance. Um, many of you guys have seen these next slides. This is just showing our, uh, our depot chargers, our in route chargers that Milwaukee will be getting. When, uh, we're getting 150s and 450 on the, in, on the uh, depot. And our picture of what, uh, in our colors, uh, our first bus is coming out in April of next year. So our pilot will be in. We plan on doing about three months of testing. And then we'll go live in October with our BRT route. I would ask for questions, but I think we're going to hold questions at the end, Tony. So I thank you and uh, hope that uh, lessons learned here are something uh, the properties can take back. We're going to find uh, my presentation, hopefully. So while I'm looking for this, Mike, um, congratulations, because we proposed on that project and didn't win. So maybe you could come up here and help me with the presentation. I don't think we've met. Um, I just want to make sure I don't stop sharing here. OK, that is the PDF. We don't want that. Here we go. Plenty of time, sir. Yeah, if it, if it, uh, there we go. I think we're all set. Okay, so um, I see a few familiar faces, actually quite a few familiar faces in the room. Um, my background, I've been with Wendell the last eight years. Uh, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer. Um, I was formerly in St. Cloud for uh, 27 years, uh, left there in 2013 and joined Wendell. And I've always been a little bit of a outfield junkie. Um, I'm by no means either a battery electric bus expert. Um, I kind of cut my teeth on CNG uh, and Wendell was the company that, uh, so my connection to them, they were the company that designed our facility infrastructure upgrades and designed our fueling station in St. Cloud. So that's kind of my background. Um, I just spent 20 minutes yesterday with our electrical engineer and our alternative fuels director. Um, this is their presentation. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, when we do this, I'm kind of kidding, but um, so my agenda, we're just going to do a, this is going to be a high level BEB overview. We're going to talk about batteries, chargers, uh, one case study. Uh, we have an on call with the state of Connecticut. And so we've done a number of properties out there to implementation. Um, and so we'll take a look at that and then we will uh, go on. Uh, Wendell as a company, um, just 
quick uh, stump speech here. We're a, a full service a and &E firm, just like uh, HNTB. We also are an energy company and a construction management company. So we do a lot of energy retrofits, a solar, um, hydrogen fuel cell, um, battery generation systems, all kinds of different things. Um, and so this is a niche market for us. Um, so although we design and, and engineer facilities, we also do a lot of BEB studies and help clients to figure out just like HNP, HNTV. So this is a picture of Fifth Avenue, uh, New York City, 1900. You can see there's one car in the picture there. And this is just to show how things can change, how quickly. And somewhere in this picture, 13 years later, there is still a horse. Um, it's kind of hard to find, but there it is. And so um, I think we've seen a lot of growth in the BEB market uh, over the last uh, number of years. And uh, as uh, Ron was saying, we're kind of what we would call the third generation BEB. Um, I kind of like this slide. It just basically shows if you take 18 units of, of solar energy, it takes one unit to deliver that through the transmission lines, you end up with 17 usable units of energy. Um, two and a half units of energy for charging. You have a slight loss of 1.5 units. So to deliver 13 units of energy to the wheel with an electric vehicle, you have a 74% efficiency. Compare that to uh, the internal combustion engine. Um, it takes 100 units of energy to start with. Um, it takes 12 units to refine and transport that fuel, which leaves you 88 units of usable energy. And then you use or lose 75 units with engine and transmission losses, heat, and transferring that energy to the wheels. So you can see how much more efficient the battery electric vehicle is compared to the internal combustion engine. That's the wheel to wheel part of it. That doesn't take into consideration a lot of other items, but that's a good pictorial way of looking at that. Uh, BEBs are significantly more expensive than traditional buses. On average, a premium of around $300,000. Um, that is changing over time. Um, some of the other challenges, charging infrastructure in your depot, um, what routes can you use uh, the battery electric buses on, um, a lot of modifications in your infrastructure at your depot. Electric rates can have a significant impact. Um, for the state of Connecticut, we did a, a study of the U.S. and depending on where you're at, depending on what electric utility you're with, there are a lot of different tariffs and a lot of different rates um, that uh, really can throw a lot of confusion into the uh, financial impacts and, and looking at what the true total cost of ownership is. Um, Ron talked about maintenance personnel training that needs to be done. Um, standardization is, we're a long ways away from that on charging uh, infrastructure right now and bus weight can also be an issue. The thing to remember about batteries is essentially these things are, these batteries on, on any electric vehicle are a built up pack. So you have um, your anode cathode package, it's built into a cell, which is then put into a module, which is then put into a battery pack. And that battery pack is managed for heat and uh, equality of charge across the cells. And then um, you have all these different battery packs that are put in series uh, in the bus. So um, the thing to remember is that when you, when you see a kilowatt hour pack on a vehicle, um, you don't actually get to use that entire battery pack. There is um, unusable energy at the top side of the battery pack, and there's a minimum allowable state of charge at the bottom of the battery pack. And so um, you have a reserve also that the manufacturer puts in um, so that you don't drain your battery too far. And so you end up with that blue piece in the middle, which is your usable energy. And then as the batteries get older, uh, the total battery energy begins to degrade as that battery pack uh, weakens. And, and I don't know, um, I, I hear six to eight years is about the average life of a battery pack. Um, I'm not sure if that's completely accurate, but I think, and I think that has been improving. This slide is, and again, I'm not a proponent of any one bus manufacturer. I, 
I love them all. Um, but this particular slide was a slide that was used for the uh, state of Connecticut uh, on a project. Um, and it just is an example of calculating what is your true range uh, on the vehicle. So you can see the Altoona testing 1.7 kilowatt hours per mile uh, in real life performance in Connecticut, um, testing 2.2 kilowatt hours per mile. So you can see that as you look at the different, you know, uh, performances that are being advertised, um, this is how it translates to real world. So if you really could get 1.7 kilowatt hours per mile, uh, you would have 192 miles on a newer battery, 152 miles on a battery once it's lost some of its energy. Um, if you can get 2.2, you can see obviously that translates into more mileage. So um, there's really a lot of uh, variables to take into consideration um, when you're looking at um, the size of your battery pack and what it means for you over a period of time. And I think we're all seeing larger and larger and larger packs coming out. Um, battery considerations. Uh, most batteries are lithium ion. Bigger isn't necessarily always better because uh, the more batteries you put on the bus, the more weight um, that you're carrying. And so um, I know there was, you know, a few years ago, uh, there was some legislation that was done that exempted buses because the axle weights were too heavy. So that's also just something to keep in mind as you're, as you're looking at how much, um, you know, battery you're, you're wanting to put on a bus. Um, most tra transit agencies, um, you know, run their fleet from 5 a.m. until late at night. So one of the big challenges of, of BEBs is range anxiety. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of effort needs to be put into, you know, how long can I, what routes can I operate this bus on? What is the service characteristics? Um, what are my loads? All of those types of things. Um, other considerations, charging types. Um, some of the battery technology has improved over time now with the battery management systems where you can do both fast charging and slow charging uh, on the vehicles. It used to be in some of the first generation that your battery chemistry changed. If you had to fast charge, it had to be one chemistry. If you slow charge, it had to be another, a different chemistry. Another big um, impact is utility rates. Um, Many people aren't familiar with demand charges, but you'll hear the term demand charges and, and what that is. And essentially what a demand charge is, is a fee or a cost that's built into the rate structure uh, by the electric utility that says, if at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're gonna use 1100 kilowatt hours, it doesn't matter if the entire rest of the day, except for that one hour, you use hundred kilowatt hours, the peak demand, you're gonna pay them to always have 1100 kilowatt hours available for you. That's basically what a, what a peak demand or a demand charge is. Um, and so that's a real impact. Um, there are places in the country where they do not have peak charges. It's pretty rare. Um, but then as you look into the different utility rates, there's, uh, and you look at the tariffs, it really just depends. You know, everybody tries to do overnight charging. That's um, would make sense. That's usually the least use of energy during that period of time. but uh, a lot of the tariffs have uh, morning shoulder, midday shoulder, mid-afternoon shoulder, evening shoulder. So there can be six or seven different tariffs within um, your utility rate structure for one particular location. So you really have to take a look at that. A uh, size and location of charging equipment is also a uh, consideration. And then as Ron mentioned, there is HVAC and ventilation impl imp you know, implications. Uh, lifts and hoists, depending on their age and what they can handle, and fire protection systems. If you've ever watched any of the videos of a lithium ion battery fire, um, a lot of the fire codes haven't really kept up with um, the BEB world. And so that's one of the areas I'm sure HNTB has worked on that too. Is I've talked to folks from AECOM and other agents, other firms too, that um, most of the fire marshals just aren't up to speed on what needs to change. So that's something that you wanna consult on as well. 
charger considerations, um, pantograph charging, um, you're able to deliver a high capacity charge. Um, most of your on route charging is pantograph, so you're charging from the top, but you do have um, route implications because you do have to take that uh, period of time to stop on route, so that doesn't work for everybody. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that you can do fast charging and slower charging on the same battery packs uh, does provide uh, flexibility to be able to do uh, different things. Um, disadvantages of pantograph charging is just some of the mechanical alignment issues and, and anytime you have moving parts, you have weather, you throw all of those things in, um, you can have uh, some issues. And even with, you know, we found in some of the systems that we've, we've worked in that um, real estate is an issue too. I mean, just having enough right away to be able to build the stand, to be able to get the transformer uh, pad and all the things that you need in place in the public right away. Sometimes you're going to private properties and trying to get, um, you know, considerations from them to have easements and so forth. So that's not always the easiest thing to do because public right-of-ways already have a lot of things in them. Uh, inductive charging is also an option. That one picture you see there of this huge unit that they're putting into the ground, that's pretty old technology. That doesn't really, you know, nobody's really doing that anymore. Inductive charging has actually come a long way. They actually have some pretty thin substrates that can literally just be uh, laid down on the ground. Um, and so the big thing with those is that you end up with underneath your bus, you end up with um, a lot of additional equipment. And you can see on that bottom left picture um, in order to have the pickups to be able to uh, charge inductively. Um, but no moving parts. Uh, you know, if you want to try to put them in your facilities, you have, uh, you know, it's a pretty big consideration because even though you can put the inductive charging pad down, you still need to get the power to the pad. So you end up with trenching and different things that um, to retrofit garages or, or in building new garages. Plug-in charging options. Um, basically the advantage of the plug-in charging options is that it's simple, it's low cost. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, iterations of chargers out there. Um, I've got a slide coming up here. Um, one of the neg negatives is that it's uh, it's manually operated. You know, a lot of our garages already, I'm just gonna go ahead to the next slide. This is a Cleveland RTA garage in midday. It's, you know, a lot of the older garages, you just don't have the space in between the vehicles. You don't have the space to put the charging units, the charging heads, uh, the drop down cords. There's, you know, you can do options like putting them up on the ceiling on reels, things like that. But it, it becomes a really uh, challenging thing to try to place these units. They give off a lot of heat. Um, and so a lot of people try to put them on the outside of the building. This is a slide. This is again, a Proterra, um, Proterra, you know, had 60 kilowatt hour chargers, 125 kilowatt hour chargers, and then up their fast charging was 500 originally. Um, and so when you think about, it's really not that complicated, but when you think about different charging options, um, ABB, uh, Proterra, others have come out with 150 kilowatt chargers. So if you had a 450 kilowatt hour battery pack and you were charging at a, with a 150 kilowatt charger, how many hours would it take to fill that empty battery? I mean, anybody tell me? <laughs> Draw your math, three hours, right? So, um, you know, essentially, um, you really need to look at all the different considerations of how you wanna charge your fleet. Um, do you wanna charge, for example, Proterra has a 1.5 megawatt charging system. You just drop it down, you put 20 charging heads out um, and you can charge 20 buses at 75 kilowatt hours at a, at a time. So if you're filling that battery pack, then you're looking at six to seven hours to do that. And you start getting to these five, 600 kilowatt hour battery packs now you're talking seven, eight hours. Well, what if that strategy doesn't work? There's times of the day where you really need to get 150 kilowatt hour charge in the middle of the day and you wanna turn some of your vehicles around. Those are all different considerations that you need to take into consideration uh, or all different um, you know, 
considerations to look at to see what is the best charging option for you. Um, the bigger the charger, 150 kilowatt, the faster you can turn a bus around. So you just, it just really depends on your operation and no two operations are the same. And I'm just gonna do a quick uh, case study. I see we're doing really good on time. This is just one of the properties. We, we've done a number of properties implemented for the state of Connecticut on our on-call. And this is Greater Bridgeport Transit. And I think it just it's just a good high level example to kind of show you what it looks like to just to get into this. So Bridgeport has won a couple of different um, Lono grants. They started out with their first one was a two BEB bus um, pilot. And so to get that pilot going, they used one charger per bus. They used 125 kilowatt charger. Their peak demand at their facility before they talked about um, battery electric buses was 119 kilowatts. So that was the most energy that they used. So if they were gonna go to 11, eventually was their goal to start with in their first phase, BEBs, that's what they wanted to build out for. The two pilots come and then nine follow behind it. Um, that increased their kilowatt hour demand to 1,659 kilowatt hours or a 1.5 megawatt increase service upgrade that they needed to bring to their facility. Um, to get that done. Now, thankfully, they had a transmission line right next to them. So that was a fairly easy lift for them. Um, but so we looked at um, what they had for space, a very constrained building, not a lot of property. So we put their charging units on the outside of the building just because of the heat and, and other things. Uh, we de developed an electrical safety plan for them. And then you can see inside the building on the other side of the wall is the charging head and the wand. Now, if we look at the electrical rate analysis again, um, my slide's kind of small, but um, you know they had uh, for their rate analysis they had um, a maximum, as I said, uh, just under 120 kilowatt hours, and their average monthly bill was $8,100 to service their entire facility. Um, brought the BEB buses on, the graph changed significantly. There they have a shoulder rate and off peak uh, rate. And then um, looking at the different times of the day that we could charge for them, it added an average of 80 and $152 a month in demand charges. So that's not a charge for electricity. That's just a charge over and above what they would consume for electricity. Then to actually charge the buses, um, was $3,632. And I don't know why they have the 40 cents in there, but I didn't make the slide. <laughs> but so their average monthly bill increased $12,696. So a little over $1,000 a bus per month um, to charge um, that fleet based on the route profiles and all of the energy studies that were done. So all 11 that, that would be the demand for all 11 buses, yep. And what's interesting about that is, let me go back, I don't have to go back necessarily, but that if you look at closely, and I think I advanced past the earlier slide, that's charging six buses at a time, maximum. So if we were to try to charge 11 buses at 150 kilowatt, or actually 125, um, then that demand would have went up even higher. So one way or another, um, it depends on you know, the charging strategy that you use. What we use for Greater Bridgeport is we used intelligent charging, char intelligent charging or smart charging system. So all the buses are plugged in and then the buses are charged as they're filled and they can move from bus to bus through battery for that management system. Um, so all 11 are plugged in, no more than six can charge at a time to keep the demand um, at that particular level. And it just happens to be that in Connecticut, the the utility is completely inflexible. They have no desire to change anything for anybody in regard to rates. Um, and that might not be the case. I know Minnesota um, up here in the Duluth area, um, I'm not sure if the rate structure has been implemented yet or not, but there is a battery electric uh, bus rate structure that has been going. Justin, is that you back there? Um, what were the rate structures like in uh, Indianapolis area? Where you were formerly? Uh, it, it was similar. You were able to negotiate lower than the charge. 
Yeah. Right. Well, in Connecticut, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't care how much electricity were you using. They just said, well, it is what it is. So um, and the state tried to try to do some things, but didn't have a lot of luck with that. But so again, just, you know, you can see 8,000 for demand, 3,000 for the actual energy. So it's going to be different depending on where you're at. Um, and it was a California system. I think it's Lancaster. Um, they actually have a utility that's owned by like an agricultural co-op or something. So there's a lot of irrigation and stuff that goes on and their rate is just tiny. So that's why they've been able to change their entire system to battery electric bus. I think it's Lancaster. I'm not, I'm not positive, but, um, so the distribution system, this is what it looked like. Um, all the little boxes on the bottom right-hand side, if you're an electrical engineer, that's, you know, that's lifts, that's lighting, that's equipment, that's just your basic service panel. And again, I'm not an electrical engineer, but um, so to charge six buses at one time, basically what had to change in the system is you had to change the small uh, transformer pad and put in a, a like four times larger 1500 KVA pad. So bring a new service to there. Then they had to change out the switchboard, which was much smaller before, um, to a 2000 amp switchboard. All the other stuff stayed the same, but then you have all this other uh, charging, inf or all this other panel infrastructure that goes in to service those 11 chargers that you see on the bottom. Um, so the cost for the electrical infrastructure for the 11 bus project was $500,000, and that didn't include the chargers. Um, so again, all 11 buses could be charged during the off peak time period. It's no more than six buses charged at a time. Um, uh, space constraints in the depot, um, as I mentioned, made it really challenging for where you could put the chargers and the charging heads. Um, and then given the sequencing of the bus purchases and the overall cost of the charging equipment, they bought um, uh, standard chargers rather than induction chargers that it was just really wasn't options for doing overhead or induction in in their facility. Um, so various locations for the chargers were considered but due to the heat that was generated by the chargers and the HV equipment necessary we placed all the chargers outside of the depot on the outside wall of the building and then all the charging heads on the inside that's just what worked for them. And let's see. Um, these are kind of unimportant slides. It's just basically showing the outside, inside charger locations on the wall. Um, this, uh, for, so if, you know, for the initial first two chargers, the foundation pads and the bollards outside the building, and you can see the transmission line in the picture there that happens to go right by their facility. So like I said, it was a pretty easy lift. Otherwise that $500,000 might've been more like yours, Ron. I'm not sure where your all your 6 million, what, how much the, <laughs> electrical infrastructure was no that but, was uh, for if i you know we took the buses that uh, you know kk was they're going to go to one facility so one facility is getting the fleet right now but again what do we have to do we had to change the orders we had to bring in new lifts uh we had to it was on our list to change the HP system at that building anyways but guess what it just became priority number one if you pull a bus in and you get the hva system and rip open those battery packs it took fun time so no one so these are all the things that had to be brought to the forefront and looked at when you bring this to your property. If you know, again, if your infrastructure, can you handle this, uh, the new technology? And if not, what are your other options? So we really didn't have an option to go outside with any of this. So that is everything. That's the forefront. That's right now turnkey. Yeah, and I've been to a lot of different places like Moline, it worked for them. They put all the chargers in one uh, area or their newest upgrade. And then they had reels that they did in their facility. And they had some of the charge point initial ones were just in between the buses in their garage. Um, but essentially for two charges, the foundation pads, bollards, power and communications was $404,000 for Connecticut last year or for greater Bridgeport last year. So I don't know, you talked about your six steps. So I'll just conclude by saying that um, I'm more familiar with the 12 steps. Um, actually, I'm not. This is why he's the expert. I only could figure six. Well, actually, actually, my father used to tell me about them because he was a big in AA for like 30 years. But um, 
but we need to admit that we're powerless over, we'll just say the battery electric bus trend um, and realize that our lives can be unmanageable with this. <laughs> and then the second step is um, come to believe that there's a power greater than ourselves to restore us to sanity. That might be the board of directors. Sounds like it. I'm not sure, but make a decision to turn your will over to the care of somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we'll take questions. If we have any, we have 15 minutes left. Yes. Please. I don't believe so because um, I guess my understanding, and there may be somebody who has an answer to that, but my understanding is that essentially, um, like I was, was just talking to uh, John Hobart with Nova here before the presentation, you know, you have the battery management system on the bus. So depending on the rate that you're charging, that system really is protecting the battery and is distributing that energy into those different cells and making sure that it's not you know, overheating or charging too fast. Same way when the energy is coming out of the battery, that battery management system prevents too fast of a drawdown on any one particular cell or um, whatnot so that your battery's life is maintained. Um, so I would say the answer to that would be no. And even we were, we were talking the whether it's a 450 kilowatt or 500 kilowatt fast charge system, um, again, the battery management system is taking care of distributing that energy that's coming in very quickly across all the different cells and modules. So, yes. Okay. And that's what I'm talking about. There's always someone else who's been down this road before you. You need to talk to your peers. And Nancy, who are you with? I'm with oh, okay. Yes. So Nancy, yeah. you're telling me there's hope at for life for me after this, correct? There's hope for life for you. Just make sure that you don't take the battery out of the concern. That's been communicated clearly, trust me. Yeah. So sorry for those people that are attending remotely. Um, Nancy's making comments, but I can't repeat them all back to you. <laughs> Yeah. So if anybody's interested in that rate structure, they can contact me or Nancy from Duluth Transit Authority. Um, I've talked to the same gal. You, you referred me to her when I was doing the rate study for Connecticut. So yeah, but it's true. The state of Connecticut did not care though that it was all public money being spent <laughs> and their public utility didn't care either. I mean, the, yes. And what is your name? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we, Ralph, did
Okay, so for those that are attending remotely, the question was, um, what has been the experience with cold weather operations? How have the batteries been um, kept warm or utilized in cold temperatures and what has been the experience? So what I can say is Greater Bridgeport just started operating the buses um, this past spring. So there really hasn't been any uh, data for that. Um, if Nancy wants to answer that question, I'm welcome to let her come up here, but uh, <laughs> um, if you I, I can tell you from Milwaukee, we have a diesel pilot here. That is a must. We are not going to survive. I yeah. cannot kid myself in that expectations. Um, the money we're spending the investment, you know, this needs to be successful uh, for the community. So we have a diesel power heater. I need to up, up the game on that. The battery management system will take care of the heating, but our buses sit in a heated barn. So we don't have that shock and draw when they go outside. You're going to, you know, they don't have to, depending on the manufacturer, come to life and heat themselves outside and everything, which is, again, is such a large straw. So it's the homework and research and what's bus builder and what battery makeup you're getting that's going to dictate that. But again, that's why you write your own RFP. So you control the subject, the content, because I know one of them didn't want to put a diesel fire here at all on the bus. And I said, well, you know, that's a shame because that's what we're requiring. Um, because after talking to Duluth and, you know, they were our guinea pig. We were up here two years ago. They were great hosts. We came up here in January because we had nothing better else to do but to find out how really cold and miserable it is here. <laughs> and to visit the buses they had and, and they were already in their lessons learned. So again, that's the takeaway of the peers and talking to the properties who have them. So yeah, it's gonna affect everything. You have, you have to, again, design it with what you want in your environment. <laughs> Absolutely, it's actually my primary heat. Okay. Yeah, so the question was, was the auxiliary heat designed under the bus? I mean, in the case of Duluth, they had the initial electric heaters, but the energy draw um, to keep the bus warm and keep the defroster going and the windshields clear was such a draw on the batteries that they retrofitted those buses with. Oh, they, did they? Oh, okay. Okay, so your, your buses, the, the Duluth buses came with the diesel fuel uh, pro heats. There you go. Yeah. And that's an what issue. This is all about. Well, and I've had people talk to me and, and just say that, that that's crazy that we're doing a battery electric bus with diesel fuel heat. Um, and I don't make a judgment whether it's crazy or not crazy, but um, if you're cold, you're still cold. <laughs> so, and as far as, as far as Duluth, um, we come up here to ski at Spirit Mountain all the time. It's beautiful when it's cold. Good for you. I prefer Florida. <laughs> that is personal preference. You will find me in Fort Myers, Florida. Next question, please. We have six minutes. Kathy. All right, so Kathy Amex from MnDOT, her question is, in rural Minnesota, a lot of the smaller communities are putting in um, charging systems. And um, she's wondering, as these systems look at potentially piloting, I'm assuming you're saying small transit buses, um, do, would we see any barriers to doing that? Um, personally, I've, the only information that I have um, looked at 
uh, was for Collier County, Florida in Naples. Um, they had received an FTA grant that talked about getting two battery electric buses and um, not promoting Lion Electric, but Lion Electric, which is a Canadian small bus manufacturer that also has some distribution in the United States, um, in California, and I think possibly in Florida. Um, that's the one bus that I've looked at, but um, to be honest with you, I talked to Forest River and a few others, and there's just not a lot of what, in my view, robust platforms out there for small bus battery electric operations yet. Um, and I may be completely uninformed, I'll acknowledge that. Um, but I think until that, uh, until the cutaway uh, bus industry um, matures a bit more, I, I just, I don't see or know of, of many systems that are doing it. And like I said, I, I may be completely out to lunch. I'll acknowledge that. Right, if, Ralph, did you have a question or your hand was up? Uh, All right. Back, we'll back room here real quick. We had the Minnesota Power guy wanted to ask it. Right. 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 And there was somebody else. The question is, is how do the batteries made in America compare to like European and other batteries in other countries? And my answer is I have no idea. <laughs> and I would honestly I don't say, think... I'm hearing that they're moving plants to America to be by America. So I did hear uh, very similar to the Nova batteries, the chemistry we're getting that someone else is uh, adopting the very, very similar chemistry because again, those battery, batteries are moving forward every day. Someone's built their mousetrap. So um, you should just expect that to change, um, you know, every, every couple of years. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but um, they want to meet by America. And let's face it, the, the American battery manufacturers don't want to be left behind in the dust. But I honestly think Europeans were far ahead of this on the game. Uh, I believe that's where my batteries are coming from, so. Okay, we have two minutes. We have one more question in the back of the room. So we do work in the hydrogen fuel cell market um, in New York and I mean, I mean, yeah, it's those vehicles have become much more reliable, but you know, again, your fuel source is going to be your your biggest shortcoming for that. But those vehicles have matured quite a bit, and there are systems like Sarda in Ohio that you know operate a number of those. Flint, Michigan, but again, those are larger vehicles that are being operated on on hydrogen. But so beyond that, um, again, the fuel delivery I think would be the the biggest thing. And all right, I think we're out of time since it is 1030. And uh, so thank you for all coming. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Those of you who joined us remotely, goodbye. I said those who joined us remotely, goodbye. Yeah.